The death sentence of David Miller was carried out by means of electrocution on December the 6th, 2018, in accordance with the laws of the state of Tennessee. The sentence was carried out at Riverbend Maximum Security Institution in Nashville. Mr. Miller was pronounced dead at 7.25 p.m. There were no victim witnesses that attended the execution, but they did ask that we read a statement on their behalf. After a long line of victims, he is left. It is time to be done. It was time for him to pay for what he has done to Lee. The victim that wrote this did not want her name given. Um, she said that we can say that she is a victim from Ohio. Now we'll have the media witnesses. They'll speak in the order that they were on the press release if you need spelling of names. So that's also um, been corrected on the website. And first up we have Ms. Lawler from the AP. So we were in a small room with in front of a bank of windows. Uh, there was a dark blind that was raised at 712. Mr. Miller was already strapped into the chair. His head was shaved. Uh, his pants were rolled up to his knees. He was barefoot. The warden asked for any last words and he said something that was unintelligible. Uh, and then he asked him to repeat it and we believe he said beats being on death row. Uh, then officers placed a sponge on his head and uh, strapped the cap on his head. Um, they uh, cleaned up water. He had water running all over his face and blew it away. He was looking down um, at 7.15, someone connected an electrical cable to the chair and we could hear the current, sort of a mechanical noise. Uh, at 7.16, there was a first jolt of current and we could see his body stiffen and then relax. And again, within that same minute, the process was repeated. He didn't move after that uh, at, let's see, 717, they, is this right? No, they rolled, so they can, at, at, no, at 7.22, they rolled down the blind, and then uh, we heard an announcement over the intercom that uh, he was pronounced dead at 7.25 p.m. Good evening. My name is Mark Salinger, and I'm with WBIR in Knoxville. Um, just to fill in a couple of... Uh, Things that uh, Miss Lillard did not uh, touch on. Um, he was uh, in a cream-colored uh, jumpsuit, wearing uh, a shirt as well as a white undershirt, um, and he was uh, kind of dripping with water once the water and the sponges were applied. Um, he two jolts of electricity were administered. Um, one, uh, as we talked about, at seven. Uh, 16 I believe uh, and his muscles kind of all clenched up um, his hands were uh, basically four of his fingers were like this and then his pinky were kind of curled up over the armrests of the seat um, he went kind of jolted up all of his muscles looked like he clenched and then a couple seconds later would come down and that happened twice um, the body seemed to look pale although I don't know what uh, he usually looks like uh, he was he sat motionless uh, water was dripping from his body again and uh, we kind of heard static uh, in the room coming from the speaker of the room and then at around 722 the blinds were lowered uh, we heard small sounds uh, we heard a door close and the uh, there was a voice that came over the loudspeaker asking for the microphone to be turned off and then at 7.20, uh, a couple minutes later, there was another voice that came on the microphone that said, this concludes the execution of inmate David Earl Miller, time of death, 7.25. Um, and to touch on uh, the victim's family as well, our organization, uh, 10 News in Knoxville, WBIR, had the chance to speak with 
the victim's mother over the phone, and um, I think that it's important to also keep her in mind in all of this. With uh, she wanted to pass along that she, uh, her daughter lived a, a life of love, of passion, and uh, ultimately uh, uh, they didn't want uh, Mr. Miller to ever be out on the street again. And uh, today, uh, that came true. Hi, I'm Stephen Hale from Nashville Scene. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add to what was, has already been said. Um, I would note um, just a couple things. Uh, of course, Mr. Miller's head was shaved. Um, he had some cuts on his leg that I guess I suppose possibly could have been from shaving uh, there as well. Um, the sponges were on his wrists and his um, uh, ankles. Um, at one point, the saline solution, as some people have mentioned, kind of dripped down his face, and one of the men in the room used a towel to wipe it off. Uh, he was looking down the whole time. I don't think any of us could quite understand, and the warden asked him to repeat it, and the best we could understand it was, uh, like she said, beats being on death row. Um, and then, yes, I would uh, just... Just as Mark said, the uh, at at 7:22 when they turned the curtain or uh, closed the curtain, um, it was quiet for a little bit. Some noises, and then yeah, we heard someone say, uh, "Ask for the microphone to be turned off." I don't know what was what was going on at that point. Um, and then a few minutes later was when they announced the time of death. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. what you just saw, but is there any initial comparisons that you might be able to make between the two? Yeah, um, the lethal injection took longer, um, uh, and you you can see the person's face. You could, we could see Billy Ray Eric's face during the lethal injection. During electrocution, there's a, um, I don't know if it's wool or I, but there's a, a sort of shroud over the, over Mr. Miller's face, and so we couldn't we couldn't see his face during it. Um, so, you know, obviously we had less of a vantage point of what he was experiencing or anything like that. Um, the lethal injection has several phases, of course, because there's multiple drugs, and so uh, there that added a different dynamic to it in terms of seeing Mr. Eirich, you know, physically react to one of the drugs, and in this case there was. A jolt of electricity and we saw Mr. Miller's body rise up out of the chair and then fall back down and then that happened again but um, and that is something I wanted to add other than that as far as I could see um, I, di I didn't see him appear to be breathing or moving in any way after those jolts ended um, uh, you know beyond that the the other similarity I would note that is not to do with the method of execution, but with both men, is that they both had a history of severe mental illness, and I think it's worth including that in y'all's stories about this, that um, both of them had pretty horrific histories, uh, which I'm sure everyone has read about at this point. But um, but yeah, so I don't know if that, if that helps. That's it. Good evening, I'm Matt Lakin from the Knoxville News Sentinel. Uh, I really don't have very much to add to what's already been said. All the times I heard sounded appeared to me to be accurate with what I observed. Uh, Mr. Miller, when he made his, when he stated his last words, there was almost no emotion in his voice. It was flat, listless. We could barely, as as they said, we could barely understand what he said. He actually said it twice and it was barely discernible both times. Had a look of resignation barely looked at us. Um, once the shroud was placed over his face and uh, the current was turned on, again, he stiffened twice. Uh, it was a much shorter process than I originally would have expected. Um, not a whole lot more that I can say that hasn't already been said. Uh, that was put over his face just after the helmet was strapped on. It was a black charcoal type gray shroud. Uh, 
Uh, hi, my name is uh, Chris Conte. I'm a reporter with WTVF here in Nashville. Uh, I will just run through uh, my notes as, um, as I experience things here. Uh, so when we were first brought into the room, uh, you could hear over the microphone uh, someone say, ready, uh, and then someone else say, sound check. Uh, it was at that point uh, that the blinds, there were four windows in front of us, um, blinds in the four windows were raised up. Uh, and, and then the light kind of illuminated the room that we were in and we could see Mr. Miller and he was essentially just staring straight at us. Uh, I will say that uh, for the time that we could see his face, it appeared that Mr. Miller really had no expression uh, at all. Um, he didn't seem to smile or frown or, or there was really, he was just expressionless. Uh, it was at 7-12 uh, when the warden asked him if he had any final words. Uh, he said something and you could make out the end of the sentence that sounded like death row. Uh, and then again, the warden said, do you have any final words? And he said something, and you could hear death row. Uh, we turned to his attorney, uh, and his attorney clarified for us that his last words were uh, beats being on death row. Um, as this is all going on, after he expressed his final words, uh, a very large sponge um, that was probably about a foot in diameter, uh, almost looks like a piece of coral, was placed on top of his head soaking wet and water was just cascading down his body, soaking his chest. Uh, and then uh, one of the uh, TDOC workers took a very large uh, leather, almost helmet, and kind of strapped it around his head. Uh, on his ankles were also similar sponges with that coral looking material uh, that were wrapped around both of his ankles. Uh, he had leather restraints on all of his arms uh, that they were tied down, as Mark observed. Uh, it appeared to me the entire time uh, his fists were kind of clenched with his pinkies out. They never really seemed to move much. Um, his face was wiped down after the initial time that the sponge was put on uh, and the helmet was uh, clipped onto him. Uh, and of course the restraints were there the whole time. Uh, I, I noted that his skin just appeared to be very pale and white, which I'm assuming is just from uh, being inside for the last few decades of his life. Um, he had, his fingernails were all uh, untrimmed, same with his toenails. Um, I also, he appeared very motionless, emo motionless for most of this. Uh, at 716 was when you could hear the very distinct hum of something electrical turning on and activating around us. Um, and that sound uh, kind of encompassed us the whole time uh, until it turned off after he passed away. Uh, it was the second, uh, jolt of electricity were actually, I wrote down the seconds, so at 7.16.53 uh, was when the second uh, jolt of electricity went through him. His body stiffened up and came up off of the chair uh, and remained there until 7.17.12, which is about 20 seconds uh, by my unofficial count, uh, that his body was kind of stiff there. His fingers uh, remained beneath his uh, palms. Small droplets of water were kind of falling from his legs and pooling around uh, the bottom of him. Um, it was at 7.18 and some 55 seconds when uh, that steady hum of electricity uh, ended around us. Um, as uh, they noted, there was that cord that was connected uh, from the uh, outside wall to the machine. Um, and uh, the actual uh, microphone that we were listening to him and anything in the room from was just a small microphone that was hung uh, from just above his head. Uh, there was from the best I could tell, uh, once the first vol uh, jolt of electricity went through him, it didn't appear that his stomach was moving. Uh, I was trying to look for any signs of breath and I, I couldn't see any um, after the first jolt and, and not after the second jolt. Uh, it was at 7.22 that the blinds were lowered uh, and the electrical hum was gone at that point. Uh, and then we heard someone say, turn off the microphone. Uh, and then uh, the warden or some, someone came back on at 725 and said this concludes uh, the sentence of David Miller. His time of death was 725. He may exit at this time. I know you said that he didn't really show much emotion when you could see his face. What was his reaction just very initially in the very seconds after the line was raised and he could see people in, in the room? He just had a blank stare. Uh, there, there didn't really appear to be much that was going on except that he was just looking straight ahead uh, and really was not 
motioning anything in terms of the movement of his eyes or, or what was going on. And then the cloth was uh, lowered across him and there was no way for us to see his face at all uh, during any part of uh, the time that he was actually electrocuted. Um, some have said that when the sound when the electrical current was turned on sounded like a loud bang. I did not hear that during the one that I witnessed. How would you describe the sound? It, it, to me, when the, when the electricity turned on uh, to electrify the machine, it almost resembled the sound of like rain hitting high intensity power lines, where it's just kind of making that steady hum. Um, that you just hear very faintly, uh, but it's but it's there constantly. Hi everyone, my name is Madison Keevy. I'm a reporter at WATE Channel 6 in Knoxville. Uh, a lot has been said. A few things that stood out to me uh, that were significant uh, was simply that when the blinds went up, uh, his face was not yet covered. Again, uh, as Chris said, that blank stare straight ahead. Um, in that moment, his hands really never moved. Uh, something else I, I noticed as well, uh, his feet barefoot uh, also never moved um, as nearly and as noticeably as his hands did um, as almost his upper body was lifted um, and then was down. Something else, um, you know, kind of going into this, we couldn't see much until the blinds, we couldn't see anything uh, until the blinds were open. We could just hear things um, and, you know, that process of Miller being moved into that room, uh, you couldn't tell what was happening when, you just heard the buckling and unbuckling uh, of different, you know, parts of the apparatus on the chair. Um, one of the things that, that I thought was significant at the time, that was the first sort of words we heard um, were through the TDOC officers that were with us in our witness room, uh, you know, with the phrase Miller cleared. Uh, shortly after that is when those blinds went up. Uh, and again, that process been described for you as well. Um, I will say when uh, his face was, was covered, there was no movement. And after those final words, there was no sound. Um, that came from him even between those jolts. Uh, there was a few minutes of waiting uh, after the second jolt uh, to see uh, if there was going to be any movement or sound, uh, and there was not. Uh, again, you know, when the blinds were closed, all we could hear were those sounds of uh, what sounded like, you know, a mop, it was, you know, wet, um, and the buckling and unbuckling, uh, doors opening and closing. Uh, so a lot of those sounds were really all we heard, minus some of those. Um, you know, his last words and some of those announcements uh, that were shared of microphone on, microphone off. Um, and this is for that period of about 15 or, or 20 minutes. Um, I will say that uh, in, in preparation for this, so to speak, um, in, in talking to different people, uh, lead detective of this case, myself personally speaking, uh, with the family, I asked, as you would as a reporter, uh, for a sweeping statement that you might expect uh, from someone who worked a case like this, who was the family or friend of the victim in a case like this. Uh, and something that struck me was not a big sweeping statement uh, that came from those individuals, but just uh, to say of the name Lee Standifer, that that's the name that, that should be remembered being passed along. Um, and, and again, I don't know what I expected when I asked that question, what kind of message I thought would come, uh, but from both those groups, that's always what it came back to was her name. A lot of the time, that's all they would say, well, just live like Lee, um, was what her family, her mother uh, shared with me. And that, I think, in its simplicity sort of sums up um, the experience leading to this. And then, of course, what you've just heard. Any questions? Blake Farmer, I work for Nashville Public Radio. Uh, you've heard the details, and um, just to fill in a, a little bit of color, uh, Jason, your question about the energy, I think what we were hearing was the exhaust fan. I'm not positive about that, but I don't, I mean, there's not a big click or anything, you know, when the when the, when the the chair is hooked up to the power, um, it's really fairly quiet, and you, you might not realize that the, the power is running through the chair, except that Mr. Milley's body, you know, raised up. Now, it didn't raise far, because he's he's strapped in with almost seatbelt kind of restraints crisscrossed across his chest. Um, but you notice, because his elbows are off, his hands are clenched, and like folks have said, the pinky's out on the side of... Uh, 
the, the armrests of the of this chair. Um, just to give you a little picture of what the setup is like, we're sitting in a in a in pitch dark, you know, trying to take notes, um, and then the curtain rises, and and that's sort of the first that we see. Mr. Miller's already um, strapped in almost completely. Uh, they just haven't put on the headgear and and put on the shroud, and that's when he's asked. Uh, if he has any last words, uh, and and like everyone said, uh, none of us understood exactly what he said, and we all turned to his attorney, Mr. Kissinger, who confirmed that he said Beats being on death row. Um, we uh, a after the the shocks, of, it's a, it's really an extended period that we're sitting there looking for any signs of life. The warden is standing in the corner of the room. We're looking around, looking for any signs of movement of fingers or or the the belly rising and falling. Didn't see any of that. I mean, you you could maybe see a little tremor of the the shroud, but uh, it probably just air moving in the room. It seemed like um, he was uh, entirely motionless. Uh, they they put the curtain down and there uh, over the loudspeaker we heard turn the microphones off which I don't recall happening uh, at the last uh, electrocution here there was a little bit of of time there uh, before they announced the time of death at 725 one other thing I'd point out that was different from the the last electrocution here uh, a month ago um, was really just a, a process thing. They spent the the guards spent a lot of time cleaning up water off the ground, uh, this, the saline solution water, uh, kind of mopping up before they were ready to energize. And this time they had put down absorbent mats and just sort of rolled those up uh, and got them out of the room to uh, I assume make it move a little more efficiently. Can you describe the, the head gear and Um, <clears throat> it looks a little bit like an oversized old school leather football helmet is kind of what it looks like um, but uh, it, you know there there's a big natural sponge that's put on top of Mr. Miller's shaved head then this apparatus that that also has a, a, a cable hooked up to it is put on and and double strapped under his chin and and cinched down pretty tight Pretty soon, though, after it's put on, um, the shroud uh, is snapped onto the, the front, and, and we don't see his face anymore. Blake, as you alluded to, you now have an incredibly rare perspective as someone who has seen two uh, electrocutions here uh, within the past month or so. Um, in addition to what you mentioned, is there anything else that you noticed that stood out more this time or something that you were able to pay more attention to now, having already seen Yeah, I mean, the whole time I'm watching, I'm really comparing it uh, to the last uh, electrocution that was carried out here. Really, things seem to go pretty much the same way, which seemed to be pretty much as planned, you know, uh, energizing the chair twice, the body staying in position. Uh, really, things seem to be carried out uh, by the book. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Stephen Kissinger. I'm an assistant federal defender in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I think we've uh, probably all heard the minute-by-minute -minute accounts of what happened, so I just want to say a few words about what we did here tonight. Um, David Miller was a friend a father and a grandfather. During our uh, last conversations, uh, one of the things he talked about was the opportunity he had to make just a handful of close friends. Uh, he mentioned uh, Nick and Gary and Leonard. Uh, and if those guys get a chance to hear this, uh, I want them to know that they were with him until the end talked about his daughter Stephanie and his grandchildren and if any of you have been reading what we've submitted to the governor what we've been saying to the courts for the last 20 years you'll know that he cared deeply for Lee Standifer and she would be alive today if it weren't for a sadistic stepfather and a mother <laughs> excuse me, a mother who violated every trust that a son should have. 
I know I came up here promising to tell you what we did here today, but I think maybe what I should be doing is ask you all that question. What is it we did here today? 